Um, thank you all for coming out. My name is Alex Rosselli. I'm the president of uh, the American Constitution Society here at Mauer. I also want to give a thank you to Outlaw for co-sponsoring the event tonight. So I'm going to start and give sort of a, a brief factual and procedural overview of the case and kind of how this case got to uh, the Supreme Court. And then I will turn it over to, uh, to the professors to kind of go through what this case is all about. In 2012, David Mullins and Charlie Craig got married. The wedding took place in Massachusetts because same-sex marriage uh, at the time was not legal in their home state of Colorado, but they decided that they would hold the reception back in Colorado. For their wedding cake, they went to Masterpiece Cake Shop. Jake, uh, Jack Phillips is the owner of Masterpiece Cake Shop, and he has been baking and decorating cakes in Lakewood, Colorado since 1993. And for him, his work is more than just about baking cakes, it's art. When David and Charlie asked Jack to make them a cake for their wedding reception, Jack refused on the grounds that same-sex marriage was contrary to his faith, and he could not make a cake uh, for an event that violates his religious convictions. David and Charlie filed a complaint with the Colorado Civil Rights uh, Division alleging that Jack had violated Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act. The act forbids discrimination based on race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation by places of public accommodation, employers, and housing providers. The Civil Rights Division determined that the bakery had unlawfully discriminated against the couple, and the Colorado Court of Appeals unanimously uh, affirmed that decision. The Colorado Supreme Court denied review, but the U.S. Supreme Court granted cert earlier this year, and oral arguments will be heard in just over two weeks. This case has drawn an unusual amount of interest from First Amendment scholars, religious organizations, and civil rights groups, and almost 100 amicus briefs have so far been filed. The question facing the court is whether applying Colorado's public accommodations law to compel the baker to create expression that violates his religious beliefs about marriage violates the free speech or free exercise clauses of the First Amendment. The court has been steadily moving towards recognizing equality for the LGBT community, as we saw, for example, in 2013 in United States v. Windsor, when the court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, as well as the formal legal recognition of same-sex marriage in Obergefell v. Hodges in 2015. But this case comes at a time when the court has been receptive to religious-based arguments for exemptions from government regulations. In 2014, in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, the court interpreted the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, to allow a closely held corporation an exemption from the Affordable Care Act's requirement that a healthcare, uh, that healthcare include coverage for contraception. Many states, including Indiana, have passed state versions of the Federal uh, RIFRA Act to allow for additional claims for religious exemptions. This case asks the court to reconcile competing constitutional claims of equality, freedom of speech, and the freedom to exercise religious beliefs. While we have to wait until December 5th to hear oral arguments, and then another few months until a decision is handed down, we're fortunate that tonight we can get a sneak peek into some of the details of the case. So I would like to introduce tonight's panelists. Professor Steve Sanders teaches constitutional law, constitutional litigation, and family law here at Mauer and he is an affiliated faculty member in political science and gender studies. His scholarship focuses on the 14th Amendment's guarantees of equal protection and due process, with an emphasis on marriage equality and other issues affecting LGBT families and individuals. His 2016 article in the Indiana Law Journal, journal titled Rifras and Reasonableness discussed whether it is possible to obtain some measure of peaceful coexistence between LGBT rights and religious liberty. Dan Conkle teaches constitutional law, the First Amendment, and law and religion here at Maurer, and he is also an adjunct professor of religious studies. His research addresses constitutional law and theory, religious liberty, and the role of religion in American law, politics, and public life. His most recent book is Religion, Law, and the Constitution, and in 1999 he was named the Robert H. McKinney Professor of Law. So thank you for coming, and please join me in welcoming Professor Sanders and Professor Conkle. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, this case is not only sort of a hot-button culture wars issue uh, presented in the case, but it's also, I think Professor Sanders may agree, 
incredibly complicated just from the standpoint of constitutional legal doctrine and the, the various arguments that are uh, suggested here not only by the parties but also by the various amicus briefs uh, that Alex uh, referred to. Uh, in any event, uh, each of us is going to talk maybe 15 minutes or so and then try to have a lot of time uh, for questions, uh, comments, and, and discussion. Uh, as indicated uh, by Alex, basically you have the baker here, uh, Jack Phillips, is making two First Amendment arguments. He's relying on the free speech clause of, of the First Amendment, also on the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. And there are, with respect to each of those provisions, there is a preliminary issue as to whether that particular clause is implicated by the baking of the cake uh, in this particular context. And then secondly, even if it is, the government might still win, the gay couple might still win if it can satisfy strict scrutiny or maybe some lesser standard of review by arguing that the state has a strong or sufficient interest in preventing discrimination despite whatever free speech or free exercise argument uh, might be presented. So I want to just walk through uh, briefly uh, the, the two basic uh, arguments that are being presented. So the first question is, as to the free speech clause, is the free speech clause implicated here? Mainly the free speech clause pr protects against government regulation of speech, but there's a corner of First Amendment law that deals with government compulsion of speech, ruling that that is, in fact, impermissible in various settings, notably including, for example, uh, the famous case West Virginia versus Barnett, ruling that school children cannot be required to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, likewise, the court protected Jehovah's Witness in another case. New Hampshire had live free or die on its license plate. Uh, the, the, the court ruled that he could be permitted to cover that up because it violated his uh, religious understanding. But there was nothing in Barnett or uh, the other uh, live free or die case predicated upon the religious objection. It was a free speech argument. The government cannot compel you to engage in expression in those particular settings. So what about here? Basically, the Baker's argument is, is that the operation of the anti-discrimination law in this particular setting is, in fact, compelling him to engage in First Amendment expression by uh, communicating uh, a message that he objects to, uh, a message that favors uh, same-sex marriage. Okay, so the question really is, is this conduct baking a cake? Uh, Professor Fuentes were asked me, when is a cake just a cake? Uh, the issue is, is this cake, in fact, expressive uh, for purposes of the First Amendment? Colorado Court of Appeals said, no, it's baking a cake. Uh, this is not expression. Therefore, the First Amendment is implicated. There's no compelled speech because there's no speech. Okay, Phillips, uh, the baker, makes two arguments. One is that his artistry in making the cake is inherently expressive. It's artistic expression protected no less than someone who's painting a picture, uh, playing a piano, should be protected as artistic speech, pure and simple. Secondly, even if it's not, in the particular context, he claims that it should be thought of as symbolic communication that would be reasonably understood by an observer to be his speech, not just uh, the gay couples, uh, and anyone seeing that cake would understand that it was, in fact, celebrating uh, the event celebrating uh, the marriage that, that, that the cake is being provided for. The United States government supports Phillips uh, in a notable uh, amicus uh, brief. The U.S. government will be helping to argue the case on the side of the baker. Uh, they try to limit the scope of, of the expression argument by saying that the compelled speech argument should work against a public accommodations anti-discrimination law only if two elements are met. One is, is that the activity is, in fact, creative in an expressive way. And number two, the expression is, in fact, uh, to be uh, presented, if you will, at some kind of expressive event, such as a wedding. Uh, and in this case, basically, the government's arguing and the baker's arguing that not only is the cake expressive, but also it is to be presented at an event at which the baker either is physically present or, as the government puts it, uh, is uh, virtually present in some way uh, with, with the cake uh, sort of extending the baker's presence. So he is, in effect, effectively participating in a celebratory uh, expressive event 
Uh, and those two elements, expression in the first place, at the celebratory event, uh, those two elements uh, are sufficient to constitute expression. Those on the other side say, uh, you know, a can of worms, slippery slope, birthday parties, there are all kinds of, of celebratory events, uh, and the government has not adequately confined the scope of the argument. Another notable amicus brief uh, that's worth mentioning uh, was filed by Eugene Volokh, a, a scholar at UCLA, strong free speech advocate, supported the photographer, uh, Christian photographer, in an earlier dispute that never got to the Supreme Court in similar circumstances. But Volokh and his co-author on the brief, uh, Dale Carpenter, basically say photographer yes, baker no. Uh, that, that basically uh, activity should not be regarded as expressive unless it has historically been regarded as artistry, photography, yes, uh, baker, no, uh, is essentially the line that they would draw, uh, although they would also say that if, in fact, the cake, and it never got to this point uh, in this dispute, if, in fact, the cake artist or the baker, uh, in fact, uh, is asked to inscribe words or particular symbols on the cake, maybe a rainbow-layered cake, they suggest that might be expressive, but simply a cake without more, even one provided to a wedding uh, in a celebratory context, should be, not be regarded as expressive any more than a chef who nicely arranges the food on a plate uh, or an artisan who crafts uh, a piece of furniture or an architect. Basically, they're saying not everything can count uh, as First Amendment speech and baking a cake without some kind of verbal or symbolic element uh, in, in terms of, of the nature of the cake, simply is not sufficient uh, to qualify as expression. So the First Amendment, in their view, uh, should not uh, be regarded as implicated. Okay, so that's the first big issue. Is the free speech clause even implicated by the baking of a cake? If it is implicated, then the question would be, can the government, uh, the Civil Rights Commission, nonetheless prevent the baker from discriminating against the same-sex couple by satisfying whatever degree of scrutiny is required. And there's a huge debate in the briefs about that. Should it be strict scrutiny? Should it be some kind of intermediate test? Or, uh, as the Civil Rights Commission argues, they basically concede that even if this is expression, the civil rights law is not regulating the expression. The civil rights law is regulating a commercial sale and because it's not targeting expression, it should not be subject to First Amendment scrutiny at all. Again, even assuming the cake is expressive, because that's not what the government is in fact targeting for regulation. At most, it should get some kind of intermediate scrutiny. But uh, the, the stronger argument is the First Amendment does not apply, even if the activity is itself expressive, because we're not regulating the expression, we're regulating the sale. On their argument, it wouldn't matter uh, if, in fact, the cake has words on it. Uh, it wouldn't matter. Basically, their argument is equal treatment is required even if the cake is pure expression. Uh, and the example raised in the briefs uh, basically uh, would include, for example, making a rainbow cake. Uh, basically, they would say, if you make a rainbow cake for one couple, you have to do the same for anybody else. Uh, without regard to their protected status. Conversely, if you put on a cake, God blesses this marriage for a heterosexual couple, you have to do likewise for the same-sex couple. Uh, so that's basically a clear-cut, uh, pretty strong, uh, uh, strict position that the content uh, doesn't matter whether there's content there or not. Basically, they claim the baker, this baker, any baker, can dis discriminate as he or she wishes with respect to what, what he or she puts on the cake so that if a baker says, I don't do rainbow cakes, that would be okay uh, with the Civil Rights Commission as long as you don't discriminate against a same-sex couple versus a heterosexual couple in whether or not you're going to do the rainbow cake. If you do it for nobody, that's okay. If you do it for anybody, you have to do it for everybody. Likewise, if you put God bless uh, this marriage uh, on the cake, you have to do that for everyone uh, as well. Okay, so that's sort of the First Amendment side. Is the First Amendment implicated on the free speech side, I should say? And if so, does the government win anyway based upon satisfaction of either no First Amendment scrutiny uh, on, the, on the government's argument here or based on whatever standard of scrutiny applies? Free, free exercise. 
Uh, the free exercise clause uh, of the First Amendment, uh, and Alex noted uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Acts, not relevant here. Not relevant here because the Federal Religi Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, does not apply to state laws. Colorado does not have a state RIFRA. Colorado state constitutional law copies the uh, U.S. First Amendment constitutional law. So basically, this is a free exercise clause argument, pure and simple. And the starting point since 1990 is a doctrine exemplified by the Supreme Court's decision in a case called Employment Division versus Smith. If you've studied First Amendment at all, this is the Peyote case. The Supreme Court rules that there is no requirement to exempt religious practices from otherwise applicable laws as long as the law is neutral and generally applicable. So if you want to ban peyote, uh, you can apply that law to Native American religious use of peyote without even implicating the free exercise clause. Uh, you're just free to extend your rules to everybody. No one can be a law unto themselves. The free exercise clause simply does not generate any uh, First Amendment protection against a neutral and generally applicable law. Colorado Court of Appeals, that's exactly what this is. Neutral and generally applicable law, you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation or the other grounds. This is being applied to the baker, no problem, no need for uh, free exercise clause uh, scrutiny. How might the baker get around Employment Division versus Smith and get to strict scrutiny? Three possible ways, well, two ways to get around Employment Division versus Smith. One is to argue, and the baker does, that this law, in fact, is not neutral and generally applicable. Why? Because it is, in fact, selectively applied. Uh, and the example given is that the Civil Rights Commission has not required bakers to bake cakes that have religiously themed anti-same-sex marriage messages uh, being requested. So basically the argument is this is viewpoint discrimination for free speech purposes, should trigger free speech, strict scrutiny. In any event, the law is not neutral. It's skewed to favor some conscious claims over others. The baker who objects to promoting same-sex marriage is not protected. That's the, the, the uh, Phillips here. The baker who objects to opposing same-sex marriage is permitted to decline uh, the, the request to bake the cake. That argument actually, I think, is rather weak, but notably, it is supported by two prominent uh, First Amendment free speech scholars, uh, Doug Laycock and Thomas Berg, especially Laycock, strong advocate of religious freedom, often advocating in the Supreme Court, basically supporting this argument that the differential application of this law essentially is, in fact, selectively protecting conscience, devaluing religious conscience, uh, and ought to be regarded as not generally applicable. But, uh, again, I think this argument is, is difficult to maintain because the response to this is that the bakers, in, in the example of <coughs> anti-same-sex marriage messages, basically the Civil Rights Commission says there's no discrimination based on protected status if, in fact, a baker doesn't want to put a, put a particular message on a cake. Again, uh, as I suggested earlier, the Civil Rights Commission is basically saying, we don't care if you put messages on or not. If you do put a message on, you have to provide it to anybody without regard to protected status. So their argument is it's still neutral, generally applicable. You can't discriminate based on religion. You can discriminate, in essence, against particular messages that you don't like. Laycock's argument is, is that that's too subtle, uh, that, that basically in reality – the law here is protecting conscience differentially in a way that disfavors religious conscience. Uh, and basically the argument is, is that to the extent that there are dignity interests at stake here, which there certainly are, there is also a dignity interest on the behalf of the baker uh, and, for that matter, the religious customers who wanted to have the cake themed uh, to, to oppose same-sex marriage. And in reality, there's a skewing here that ought to be regarded as rendering the law, in fact, uh, not neutral. Part of the argument made by Laycock uh, is, is, in essence, sort of to uh, intuitively suggest that we ought to be balancing competing liberties here, that same-sex marriage certainly should be protected by law as it is, uh, 
but there ought also to be room in a pluralistic society for those who oppose same-sex marriage on religious grounds to object. Again, both sexual orientation and Laycock argues religious identity are core aspects of human personality uh, and, and should be protected in terms of uh, you know, your right to define uh, and implement your own understanding of yourself. That should apply to the baker as well as to those uh, who, in this case, are, are requesting uh, the service uh, that they have done. Laycock and other arguments in the brief also refer to the language of Justice Kennedy uh, in the Obergefell same-sex marriage case in which he refers for the majority to opposition to same-sex marriage as being grounded uh, in what he called decent and honorable religious objections. So basically part of this is a play on Kennedy to try to suggest, yes, we're for same-sex marriage, You've got, we've got same-sex marriage, but remember what you said uh, about the honorable and decent uh, religious objections. Uh, more quickly, second potential route around Smith to get to strict scrutiny is, I think, very dubious, but again, it's possible. Uh, the Court and Employment Division versus Smith said that if you have a hybrid claim that's not strictly free exercise but also includes something else, like free speech, maybe that hybrid situation will trigger strict scrutiny even if free exercise standing alone will not. That argument has never been used uh, successfully by any lower court to my knowledge. Uh, it's been criticized uh, as being incoherent. I doubt the court will go there, but it could. It could say, hey, compelled speech, it's plausible. Free exercise is relevant. We'll combine those two things together uh, and find in favor of, of, of strict scrutiny. Third path, because those are the two ways to get around Employment Division versus Smith and get to strict scrutiny. The third way to get to strict scrutiny is to argue, as has been hinted at here, that Employment Divisions versus Smith should be repudiated, uh, that we ought to go back to pre-Smith uh, constitutional law, which essentially is the same thing as what RIFRA now requires when it is applicable. If, if, if the court were to go that route, I think that's unlikely, but if the court were to go that route, then cases like Hobby Lobby would be, would be relevant because you have a similar sort of complicity argument here as you had in Hobby Lobby with the uh, company's provision of contraceptive products uh, in a way that they thought made them complicit in, in conduct that they thought was morally, morally objectionable uh, on religious grounds. So that would be a third potential way uh, to get to strict scrutiny if the court were prepared to revisit, potentially go back uh, to pre-Smith uh, constitutional law. Okay, final point then is, is that even if the court reaches strict scrutiny, under the Free Exercise Clause or under the First Amendment, you have the issue of doesn't the government have a compelling interest in preventing uh, sexual orientation discrimination? So far, in every state court, including states that apply something like strict scrutiny, state of Washington, for example, no exemption claim in this setting has been granted, uh, even in states that have RIFRA, even in states that purport to apply strict scrutiny, basically finding strict scrutiny satisfied uh, in the prevention of discrimination. That's an interesting issue the court would have to confront. Uh, does it matter that the same-sex couple readily obtained a cake elsewhere? Uh, is it enough that the dignity interest of the same-sex couple uh, is uh, infringed by being denied uh, service from this particular baker in this particular setting. Uh, just to, to make uh, one final note of interest, uh, and that is the U.S. government, and, and the big uh, analogy that runs into somebody like the baker is what about an interracial marriage? Uh, would we protect a baker who refuses to make a cake uh, for an interracial marriage because on religious grounds the baker objects to interracial marriages? U.S. government says that would be, that would satisfy strict scrutiny because of the unique and distinctive history of racial discrimination in this country, but the U.S. government suggests sexual orientation, not necessarily so, uh, especially since we have invidious, invidious racial discrimination versus, again, this decent and honorable uh, opposition to same-sex marriage. So uh, that's, that's all I have to say uh, at this point. Complicated case, lots of interesting issues. Uh, Professor Sanders will predict the result, but I, I, I'm not prepared to do so. Um, Professor, Professor Conkle and I have had some great discussions about this case. Um, we may 
I'll cover some of the same ground he will be. I'll probably be a little more opinionated or a little more normative uh, in my views of the case than, than he was. Um, so I think this is one of those cases where everybody has an opinion and most people feel guided by some basic sense of justice when they reach that opinion without bothering to inquire too deeply into the actual facts. The problem is, of course, most people on, people on both sides of this debate have irreconcilable views about what would constitute justice in this case. For supporters of gay and lesbian rights, it was a, an affront to Craig and Mullen's dignity. Uh, Phillips is a boor, if not a homophobe, who needs to be punished. For many conservatives, Phillips is a hero, um, a martyr against political correctness and the power of government to tell people what they must believe um, about same-sex marriage or anything else. But emotions and symbolism aside, this case will be decided based on facts and law. And I think the facts and the law favor the gay couple and not the baker. Moreover, there are a number of ways the court could rule narrowly so that it doesn't have to use this hard case to make bad law. Now, we're told that Phillips is the Michelangelo of wedding cakes. He's the Bernini of buttercream, um, a flower-covered genius whose creations must be respected as art. It follows uh, his supporters say that his cakes must receive strong protection under the First Amendment. So as a threshold question, does it matter whether the baked goods he creates should be considered art? I would say it should not matter. Many products are customized before they're sold to consumers. Many goods and services involve professional and even artistic judgment by the people we hire to execute them. But just because an object is aesthetically pleasing or involves creativity or even passion doesn't mean that the activity of creating that object can be insulated from general business and social regulation. First Amendment law is abundant on this point. Subway calls its employees sandwich artists. Should this allow Subway to turn away customers based on their race? Obviously not. Um, I, I've gotten a lot of compliments on the tile backsplash in my kitchen. Professor Conkle has been there. I mean, the colors just really work. But should the contractor who did it be insulated from paying taxes for workman's compensation? No, of course not. If Jack Phillips decided he couldn't be true to his muse without the use of banned coloring agents or flavoring substances, would the food safety laws have to yield to the First Amendment? Of course not. And so the simplest way out of this case for the Supreme Court would be to avoid the messy question of whether uh, bakery products are constitutionally protected expression. Colorado is not seeking to impose its aesthetic or political or religious orthodoxy on Phillips. It's just saying Phillips can't discriminate among the people who want to buy his art. This is simple regulation, not of expression, but as Professor Skunkel said, of conduct. Um, Colorado law prohibits Phillips as the owner of a business that's open to the general public from engaging in the conduct of excluding customers or refusing to sell them certain products based on their religion, race, uh, or sexual orientation or sex. If Rembrandt opened a shop in Colorado where he sold his paintings, the same rule would apply to him. Now, while some conduct, like flag burning, is inherently expressive, the Supreme Court has rejected the idea that any conduct can be labeled speech simply because the person claims he intends to express an idea. And even if we grant that Phillips is engaged in some sort of speech or artistic expression, the court has explained many times that the First Amendment does not prevent neutral and general laws about conduct or commerce from imposing incidental burdens on speech. Newspapers cannot be censored, but their owners can be required, like all other businesses, to pay taxes. No one has denied Phillips the right to speak, write, petition, or pray against same-sex marriage. He can display religious and conservative political messages in his store if he wants. He can donate Christmas cookies to Roy Moore. But well-established First Amendment speech law does not give him the right to refuse to comply with general laws um, like an anti-discrimination statute simply because he believes his personal understanding about gay marriage is more important. Um, this law is settled, and I think applying it to Phillips would make this an easy case. This is basically the Colorado Commission position that Professor Kunkel outlined. 
Okay, but not so fast, Phillips and his supporters say. This is more than just business regulation requiring him to comply with a non-discrimination law would conscript him to express a specific message, namely support for same-sex marriage, which is against his conscience. According to his lawyers, Phillips not only believes he honors God through his artistic talents, he further believes that by creating and furnishing a wedding cake, he is communicating his own message about the legitimacy of the couple and their wedding. So let's unpack this argument because like a cake, I think it has several different layers to it. Um, First, much of the fascination with this case focuses on the unique symbolism of a wedding cake. But Phillips doesn't just refuse to create uh, custom wedding cakes for same-sex weddings. He's apparently refused to make any products if they're to be used in such celebrations. According to the brief by the gay couple in the case, the shop had previously refused an order to make cupcakes for a lesbian couple's commitment ceremony. Now, to be sure, Phillips has said he'd be happy to make the gay couple a birthday cake or to sell them brownies, and so he's not on the same he's not a bigot who wouldn't allow you know a person of a different race or a different uh, uh, ethnicity or sexual orientation to walk into his shop. But the underlying theory of anti-discrimination laws like Colorado's is that discrimination based on immutable or historically disadvantaged characteristics like sexual orientation is not only harmful to individuals, it's corrosive to the presumption of political and social equality that underlies a democratic society. And so whether the matter involves wedding cakes, cupcakes, something else, whatever, the point is that Phillips denies services based on his customer's identity. He refuses to treat gay people equally with straight people. Once again, this is about conduct, not speech. The Supreme Court could hold. Second, second layer, even if it is all about a wedding cake, it's undisputed that Phillips and the gay couple never got to the point of discussing any particular design. This this case is not a case about a request for a cake with rainbow frosting or an inscription reading queer power. For all Phillips knew, the couple would have been happy with one of the stock designs in his portfolio, something he had made many times before. He had no knowledge before he refused them service about what specific message, if any, they intended their cake to communicate. Now, as Professor Conkle explored as well, I think this might well be a different case if the couple had asked for a political or religious message or image that burdened Phillips's conscience. If an African-American baker refuses to decorate a cake with a swastika, he is not discriminating on the basis of race. He's simply refusing to associate with a political message. And so similarly, if Jack Phillips refused to decorate a cake with Wiccan imagery or a pink triangle, um, there would be a decent argument that he was not violating Colorado law because he was not discriminating based on any protected characteristic. Like the black baker, he simply refuses to traffic in a message with which he disagrees. But again, that is not this case, even if many people seem to assume it is. And so, as it often does with sticky and unsettled social questions, the Supreme Court could kick this can down the road and decide that Phillips' First Amendment rights were not violated because he was never asked to create any particular message. He was simply asked to make a cake. Third layer, um, and this is the messiest one, Phillips rejoins that following Colorado law would actually force him to be complicit with something he regards as sinful. That is, regardless of whether the gay couple's cake carries any written messages or symbols, a cake would represent Phillips said in earlier legal proceedings, quote, his personal endorsement and participation in a ceremony and relationship he opposes. And a a brief by a group of prominent religious scholars repeatedly compares Phillips to the Jehovah's Witnesses children in West Virginia versus Barnett who refused to salute the flag. Well, unlike the children in Barnett, first of all, Phillips was not compelled to voice the government's own message. 
To be sure, the First Amendment places limits on the ability of the government to force one speaker to host or sponsor or accommodate another speaker's message, Um, but that's usually because the host's own speech would thereby be burdened. And so the Supreme Court has held, for example, that a private parade, which is inherently expressive, can't be required to accept a float whose message it disagrees with. Similarly, the Boy Scouts would not be forced to could not be forced to accept members whose presence would conflict with the group's own expressive goals. But while we can respect Phillips' sincere beliefs about his work, the court should not accept this idea that a commercial commodity like a wedding cake reflects Phillips' own personal constitutionally protected speech. I just think this is an absurd conceit that must be rejected. This is the main argument that Phillips' lawyers, as well as the Trump administration, are relying on, and most of it comes off, I think, as kind of a maudlin appeal to emotion rather than legal reasoning. Phillips, the humble Christian shopkeeper with a whisk in one hand and a paintbrush in the other, probably bought the paintbrush at Hobby Lobby. Um, (laughs) Phillips is not a speaker in this case. He's been neither conscripted nor invited to participate in the wedding celebration. As a legal matter, his own metaphysical beliefs about the role he plays in the wedding are simply not relevant. He's a caterer who has sold a commercial product one that may involve skill to create and is pleasing to look at, but is still, at the end of the day, a commercial product. The perspective of the the quote-unquote reasonable observer is central to First Amendment law, and no reasonable observer could have believed that Phillips was endorsing or participating in Craig and Mullen's marriage. Um, How these principles might apply to musicians or other professionals whose work does require them to be more intimately associated with the wedding, that can be a different question for a different case. Um, But as as First Amendment scholars Eugene Volokh and Dale Carpenter, one of the briefs that Dan referenced, write in their brief, no one looks at a wedding cake and reflects the baker has blessed this union. The fact that the cake is important to the celebration does not mean that Phillips himself is participating. Phillips is not the cake. Whatever expressive character the cake may have, it's the couple's expression, not Phillips. As the court has explained in several different contexts, that where there's little likelihood that an expressive activity could be attributed to a host or a business owner, the host or the business owner, like Phillips, may not claim that he or she was compelled to affirm some opinion or belief. Thus, the court has said the First Amendment does not allow a law school to refuse to obey a law requiring that it accommodate military recruiters because as much as the law school might object to that, a reasonable observer would not think the law school was thereby endorsing military policy just by letting the recruiters come in. The owner of a shopping mall was not allowed to invoke the First Amendment to refuse to comply with a state law allowing people to speak or gather petition signatures on its property because there was little likelihood that their speech would be identified with the owner. And so I think the same thing applies here. If we accept the idea that Phillips is not speaking, uh, we don't have a compelled speech problem. Accepting Phillips' argument would do significant damage to everyday laws like non-discrimination statutes because it has no logical stopping point. It would open the door for defendants seeking to justify the desire to discriminate, to advance all sorts of abstract arguments that could never be either proved or disproved about what constitutes speech or participation. Um, The issues in this case have been framed primarily around speech, Um, but they really are as much or more about religion. But again, that doesn't matter for the reasons that Professor Kunkel outlined, the principle that religious beliefs cannot cannot be allowed to make every person a law unto himself is also a foundation of the court's religion jurisprudence. And under the First Amendment, uh, as with religion, uh, with religion as with speech, the Supreme Court has made clear that while beliefs cannot be regulated, conduct can be. In closing, I would just say one can, I, I can, you can really appreciate, I think, that to Phillips, 
Um, all of these arguments that we're talking about here seem like formalistic legal mumbo jumbo. Um, empathy and the equities of a particular situation do indeed have roles to play in legal decision making. But in the end, the rule of law means that the court can't decide based on sympathy for Phillips and it shouldn't decide based on it, some impulse that it would be a really great idea for it to roll up its sleeves and wade into the culture wars over religious liberty. Um, I hope I've demonstrated that I think the facts show that Phillips violated Colorado law, that he was not engaged in constitutionally protected speech, and thus under just an application of existing First Amendment precedent, he cannot prevail. So thank you. Thank you. That was great. <clears throat> uh, Professor Sanders, my, my question is for you. You started your talk saying that this case will be decided on the facts and the law. Mm -hmm. And I have some skepticism towards that. I'm thinking about critical legal studies. And so my guess is that by a five to four decision, the court's going to find in favor of the baker, but it's not going to be based on law. It's going to be based on their political preferences. So I guess I was curious on your thoughts about the role of critical legal studies and how the court will decide this case. It won't be on the law, but it will be on their biases. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I wrestle with that every time I teach constitutional law. How much do we want to say this is just about the preferences of the justices and how much do precedent and legal argumentation and logic matter? I mean, there, there's just a, you know, there's a lot of First Amendment law here uh, that I, I think, um, the I think any justice attempting to write that opinion would have some difficulty, um, Getting or finding a way for the opinion to write, getting a, getting around some the settled First Amendment principles that I've outlined. Um, I, I, I mean, I, for what it's worth, I, I would predict that Justice Kennedy, the swing vote, will actually not be with the Baker. Uh, I think it'll be five four the other way. I think Justice Kennedy, in the end, you know, won't be persuaded by sort of all the martyrdom talk about Phillips. Um, and, uh, and, and I don't think he'll keep the opinion for himself. I hope that somebody like Justice Kagan will write it because I think she could write um, a, a, a narrow, careful, you know, a, a sensible uh, a First Amendment doctrine-based opinion. Um, you know, ha have the justices indicated how they feel about certain things? Can we speculate that Justice Alito or Justice Gorsuch, you know, are, are sort of culture warriors deep down in, in the way you've suggested? Sure, I, I think that's right. I don't think Justice Kennedy is. I don't think, you know, I think Justice Kennedy, um, you know, uh, 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 agonizes a lot and plays this interesting role as a swing vote. But I don't think he necessarily just puts his finger in the wind or votes according to his views. I, I think he, as, as much as his opinions are often not models of great legal reasoning, I, I think he tries to do what he thinks is genuinely legally the right thing. I, I guess I might jump in. My prediction is five to four, but that's as far as I get. Uh, but, but, but I do think that, and I don't know if this is consistent or inconsistent with the critical legal studies, maybe not, but I do think if the Baker wins, I do think it will be Kennedy writing, and I think it will be, I mean, consistent with sort of a Laycock-style balancing equities. There are liberties on both sides here. There are dignity interests on both sides here. We have a legally new innovation uh, rep represented by Obergefell that departs from not just hundreds but centuries of years of Western tradition, uh, and it's, it's worth accommodating in uh, – but he would have to write an opinion, uh, as, as Professor Sanders suggests, that somehow tries to confine this in such a way that we're only talking about a limited group of folks who can make these objections. Uh, again, I don't know how you do it exactly, but you do it in such a way that it's about creating products. It's not about off-the-shelf products, uh, and that's, I think, in the record. You make it about a wedding, uh, and I don't know if you can limit it strictly to a wedding, but the U.S. government's sort of trying to make that kind of an argument uh, so as to attempt to confine uh, the, the ruling in such a way that it really can't go too far. On the other hand, I do think, I mean, the easy, clear-cut result is to go the other way. But even if you go the other way, you know, if you're like somebody like Volokh, you resolve the baker cake, you still got the photographer. Uh, and Volokh, curiously, I was speculating with, uh, with Steve about this, Volokh and Carpenter talk about the baker, they talk about the artisan, they talk about the photographer, 
They don't mention the florist, okay, uh, at all. They don't mention the pending case before the Supreme Court in Arlene's Flowers case from Washington State, which is still pending on cert, notable by its absence. I mean, do they don't know what they think about that? In other words, so that if, even if you, you know, if you find against the baker, unless you write a broad ruling, and you could, uh, uh, basically saying doesn't matter if it's expressive, doesn't matter if you're Rembrandt, uh, you know, you have to provide your services on an equal basis. They could do that and maybe resolve it all. But if it's, if it's subtle, like the baking is not expressive, uh, you haven't really resolved it for the photographer and the other sorts of uh, uh, providers. So you mentioned that the baker testified that he'd be willing to bake the gay couple a uh, birthday cake or cupcakes or whatnot. Um, does that strengthen his argument towards just a religious conviction against... Uh, gay marriage as opposed to just discrimination in general i think it I think it could be relevant although uh, the the fir baker 's first argument as a matter of state law, which failed was that he wasn 't discriminating based on sexual orientation at all uh, in other words that he 's happy to serve same sex uh, or not same sex couples he 's happy to serve gay and lesbian people, including same sex couples. He just objects to the wedding. Colorado Supreme Court, Colorado Court of Appeals rejected that, I think properly so, basically to refuse a particular type of product uh, based upon uh, someone's protected status should count. But it's still potentially relevant that the baker, if, if you get to something like strict scrutiny, okay, the issue is does the state have a compelling interest in protecting against the indignity of being denied service and at least arguably, uh, there may be indeed substantial indignity uh, for this same-sex couple being denied uh, the, the cake. Presumably the indignity would be all the more great if, you know, if the baker had a sign on the door, gays and lesbians not welcome, you can't buy cookies off the shelf. In other words, the, the degree of indignity might matter uh, to uh, if you get to the point of strict scrutiny or something like that. The, the degree of indignity uh, issue, if it goes... Uh, does it go the other way? Like, if they, if he's refusing to bake a birthday, like something less important than a wedding, does the uh, degree of loss of dignity get less, and does that change the balancing? You mean from from the standpoint of the gay couple? Yeah. That it'd be worse to be denied the wedding cake than the the birthday cake. Something that they that was a less. Like, maybe not. Enough. Maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, interesting interesting point. I mean, you know, in terms of tangible injury here, it's hard to make the case uh, because the gay couple readily found another baker, in fact, provided a free cake with a rainbow layering. So the tangible injury isn't there. I, don't, I, I see your point, though. You know, maybe the indignity is greater if this is a momentous occasion for us and we're being turned away. Uh, as compared to for something else. I think the issue is partially whether, in fact, the law should regard somehow opposition to same-sex marriages, or at least the celebration of them, as being somehow decent and honorable, as, as the language in Obergefell suggested, rather than purely invidious bigotry. Uh, and if it is not purely inv invidious bigotry, then maybe strict scrutiny takes on a different light. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it makes a – so he refuses to bake the birthday cake, you're saying. I, I'm not sure – you know, I, I, I think I agree with Dan. I think it, it's probably emotionally more fraught for the couple uh, to be denied for their wedding. I mean, it's an indignity either way. I think the main thing about that is it makes the baker's situation much less sympathetic. I mean, he, he looks more like just a sort of garden variety bigot who doesn't want to associate with gay people. But again, because so much of, of the baker's case and his supporter's case is, is all – premised on this unique symbolism of the wedding and he pours his soul into this and he's associating with something that the, the wedding is, is, is sinful in his eyes. So I, I just think it, it, I don't know if it changes from the perspective of the, of the gay couple, but it certainly makes the Baker's case weaker, I think. Uh, Professor Conkle, I'm thinking back to the Law Review article that you wrote before Obergefell where you predicted uh, the various ways that Obergefell uh, could come out. It came out with that result, but kind of not in any of the ways that you predicted it. Um, doc doctrinally, Obergefell is kind of an outlier at this point. 
Um, but if the court follows Obergefell's reasoning in this case, what then will become the Obergefell doctrine? So you're saying apart from religious objections, really, right? Are you? Yeah. And so if, if the court draws on Obergefell in this case, will that more solidify the status of Obergefell as a more general part of the doctrine rather than well, I mean, I mean, I think uh, Professor Sanders could come. I mean, the Supreme Court decided more or less summarily, maybe summarily, uh, a case sort of reaffirming Obergefell uh, rather vigorously, uh, I, I would suggest, with some dissenting comments from Gorsuch and others. So I think the court's already, uh, in, in a specific context, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if I'm going to be responsive or not, but I do think the fact that Obergefell – is a five to four decision with the four dissenters describing the decision as not just wrong but essentially lawless is potentially relevant background to the Baker's case. Uh, so I don't think it would be an occasion to revisit Obergefell uh, and, you know, attempt. I, I don't think I could be wrong. I, I don't think even the most uh, conservative justices would want to try to say, let's overrule Obergefell and eliminate same-sex marriage. But I do think their objections to Obergefell could play into their argument that at, the, at a minimum, we ought to protect those who have objected to it. So uh, to put it somewhat differently, I think if Obergefell had been more persuasively written from a doctrinal standpoint, but more to the point, if it had not been five to four, if it had been unanimous, like Brown against Board of Education, it would have presented sort of a different context for this uh, debate about uh, objection. The, um, the follow-up case that Professor Kunkel mentioned was a case that didn't get a lot of attention, decided at the end of last term, Pavan versus Smith. Basically, Alaska, uh, a, a lesbian couple who were married, one of them had a child through artificial uh, – using a sperm donor. In that situation, if the woman was married to a man, the husband's name would go on the birth certificate, even though everybody knows he's not biologically connected to the child because there was a sperm donor. But Alaska refused to do that for the female couple, and the Supreme Court said, um, no, you you can't do that. Um, the, the, essentially, I think that case stands for the idea that Obergefell was not just about the right to get a marriage license. It was about the right to sort of participate in the institution of marriage and all the benefits marriage carries on equal terms. So, you know, I, I could make an argument that that may strengthen the case of the gay couple here. If, if, if the wedding cake and the ceremony is such an accepted part of the experience of, 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 of marriage and our history and tradition, then this indignity to the gay couple is is significant in ways that sort of Berg, Obergefell talked about. Thanks. So um, I'm just thinking that whether it's 5-4 either way, if the um, – whether it's 5-4 argument – in support of the Baker is based on free exercise, as Professor Conkle, you just um, hypothesized, based on like a Doug Laycock kind of argument. I just don't see a principled way to do that. And so, you know, going back to Joe's initial comment, that, that I just don't see it. I have trouble even following it when you described it. Um, and then I feel like you put a um, a helpful spin on it by saying implicit in this is the idea that the Baker's views are decent and honorable and we should be balancing. So that makes sense, but that's for the legislature. You know, it seems to me that's one thing that we haven't talked too much about. That seems to me, get, unless you're going to overrule Smith, um, there's no room for that here. You know, the legislature can decide to have that kind of an exception to the anti-discrimination protections based on sexual orientation, but it didn't. So I just don't see, you know, so that really disturbs me uh, because I think that there's a good chance that, I think it's going to happen, whether it's five or four, um, and I think it's interesting, and I'm interested in your reaction to this, that Attorney General Jeff Sessions, when he talks about this cake, this case, this cake, this, <laughs> this case, um, so the government's brief is all, on compelled speech. So they don't make they don't an exercise. When he right. talks about it, it's all 
this violates the free exercise religion um, uh, constitutionally protected rights of the poor baker who's a decent and honorable guy who really in his heart you know thinks it's a sin which nobody questions it's you know fine nobody is is doubting that but the attorney general talks about it that way like this guy is being but he says you know being compelled to participate and be complicit in this sinful wedding but i you know I, so i'm just curious so, I'm, I'm just really worried, like, thinking about teaching this case, you know, later, and whether it's a dissent or a majority, it's just if you can unprincipled, well, I, I think. Mean, I don't want to be flip, but if you can teach Obergefell, uh, you can teach whatever Kennedy writes. Anything. I mean, I mean. Oh, I don't think so, but, well, okay. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think that it would be, if, if Kennedy goes on free exercise. Yes. He, he, again, it may be somewhat incoherent. He can always do the hybrid claim argument. Okay, if that's different. But if he does the Doug Laycock... If he does the Laycock, I think the Laycock ba basically would have to involve some fancy footwork, basically saying that in reality, on the ground, roughly comparable claims of conscience are treated differently. You've got the baker who refuses to bake the cake that is critical of same-sex marriage, and it's religiously themed. The Civil Rights Commission said that's not discriminating based on religion if you won't bake a cake with a scriptural passage on it uh, that is hostile to, to gay rights. But you won't protect Phillips uh, in this case. So that it's, uh, it, it's not utterly implausible. I, I, I just thought, but isn't it right, you said under there, and I haven't read yeah, yeah. as many I briefs mean, as I you have, but, you, but isn't it that the, the baker can decide, not? you said, to not... In, include any inscription that That's the argument of the civil rights commission right yeah right, so, right. so, so I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that i agree with lake uh, argument but i don't i don't think even i just can't even get my mind around it, it would be impossible to, to mm. basically say uh, and notice the, the word roughly you have roughly comparable claims of conscience a presumably secular at least not conservative christian baker being permitted to protect his conscience by not promoting a message against same-sex uh, uh, marriage, whereas, by contrast, this baker is at least, in his view, symbolically being forced to, to take the opposite view. So it's not utterly implausible. I think Kennedy mm -hmm. could write it. Uh, Kennedy could write it. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I think that he could also get into his big theme of dignity, which Steve uh, has uh, written and thought about, Kennedy, I think in Hobby Lobby, uh, in his separate opinion, talks about protecting free exercise to ensure the dignity of religious objectors. So you have dignity of the religious objector. You've got the dignity of the same-sex couple. And I do think it would be creative. It have to be creative. It would have to be departing in some way from Smith. Yeah, but that's right. I could imagine it. I, and they I, won't admit they're doing it as the problem. And what are the implications of saying? I'm getting used to that. I yeah, mean, okay. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I mean, I, I think that, you know, uh, in all kinds of settings, uh, especially when Kennedy writes the opinion, you know, the doctrine is not always easy to follow. Yeah. Uh, and he can write it with high rhetoric. And I could see him writing this opinion. I, I, I tend to think, and I think Steve, I tend to agree with Steve, that it'll go the other way. Five to four, Baker loses just because I think it does uh, potentially create too much of a can of worms. Uh, the other interesting argument Laycock makes, and this is not inconceivable, uh, basically Laycock says that if, in fact, the court decides that based on current doctrine it cannot find in favor of the baker on free exercise grounds, then it should have re-argument about employment division versus Smith. Uh, and, and he basically says... To his credit, he says, don't do it without re-argument, mm -hmm. uh, because he was among those back in 1990 who objected to the court's decision in Smith, which repudiated prior doctrine without re-argument. So he says, don't make that mistake again. But if you can't find a favor of the baker, uh, I think he should win, Laycock says, under current law. That may be dubious. But if you don't think he can win, let's re-argue this, and maybe we should go back to pre-Smith doctrine, which might, I don't know about Kennedy, might very well be attractive in the current sort of climate, uh, which has shifted radically from being a, sort of a Justice Brennan liberal position for accommodation back in the 60s uh, to being a more conservative uh, concern now. But you might have four votes, maybe five, yeah. uh, to revisit Smith. And notice that even if you revisit Smith and you go to strict scrutiny, the baker could still lose. 
as, as the bakers and the florists have lost all over the country, even in regimes that recognize the strict scrutiny test. So, I mean, it's, it, I think it's one thing whether Justice Kennedy or someone else, if they vote for the baker, could muddy up the doctrine enough to reach that conclusion. But I, I think the Laycock argument is not supported on the facts. And that's why I was sort of trying to emphasize in, in my presentation that the court, you know, uh, we need to understand what this case is about and what this case is. The baker was never asked to bake a cake with a pro-gay, mar- pro-gay marriage message. So in that sense, it's not analogous to the baker who turns away the conservative anti-gay marriage message. Again, to to get there, you have to believe in this metaphysical idea that everything the baker does when he bakes a cake, even if it has no message on it whatsoever, is somehow an exercise of religion. You know, that's, that's his view, but I just think that's implausible. So again, I don't think those cases are comparable. And, and I, I think we both agreed that, that there would be a decent argument that if that were the case, if the baker were asked to, to, to bake a cake that had a message, uh, that was, uh, that, that was religiously or politically or socially, um, burdened his conscience, then again, he has the same right as the black baker to not bake the swastika cake. But we have to have a concrete request for a concrete message or image to decide that case. We don't have that here. I'm curious if, if particularly if the court reads this case narrowly, if we'll see another wave of cases in states where they have passed an analogous RIFRA Act, or more generally, I guess my question is, how relevant is it that Colorado doesn't have a state RIFRA? Well, it's, it's tremendously it's relevant doctrinally in that if the state did have a RIFRA, then all of this stuff about general applicability and is there differential treatment and uneven protection of conscience would be beside the point. You would go straight to the issue of whether there is a substantial burden on the exercise of religion. And if the state used Hobby Lobby, by analogy, under its state law RIFRA, I think there clearly would be a substantial burden uh, because you basically defer uh, heavily uh, to the religious objector. So you basically would get to strict scrutiny. Again, prior to this case, I I found the grant of cert surprising in this case because there really has been no conflict uh, in any of the courts that have considered these issues. Again, even in states that have RIFRAs or comparable uh, state constitutional law, the uh, wedding providers have all lost. So it could be that if, if the court finds in favor, uh, it would depend on how it reasoned it. If, if the court found in favor by triggering strict scrutiny and say strict scrutiny is not satisfied, a state could still go the other way uh, under uh, – well, no, they couldn't because they, this, this is going to be a First Amendment decision. Uh, so bas- in some sense it would uh, – I guess I've got to back up a minute here because basically if the court decides in favor of the baker – and by implication, the florist, the photographer, and so on, then presumably you don't need RIFRA uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, to that extent, it wouldn't matter. But if the state did have a RIFRA, that would have been a much more straightforward argument for the baker. And I think these cases will continue to come up. As I said, the court can kick the can down the road by finding a way to narrowly get out of this case, but there will be other cases. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because there may be significant differences between the baker, the florist, the singer, and uh, the photographer, and so forth. Those details should matter. Is this, okay. Um, I'm a little um, unclear about the distinction uh, on how this would be a different case if there was writing on the cake and he disagreed to the writing as opposed to him making the cake without the writing when the object of what he's making implicitly is celebrating something that he disagrees with. Um, so it seems to me like the action of the cake it's in, in the nature of the thing and what it's made for is implicitly saying an expression of, of that goes against his views. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just like... Yeah, well, that, yeah. That, that, you've, you've, you've precisely got the baker's argument, right? I mean, that is his argument. That is an argument supported by uh, the Justice Department, essentially that this is a implicit symbolic communication, no less than if the cake said, we celebrate this wedding. Uh, And and it's attributable to him. Okay, so that's that's precisely the baker's argument. The competing argument is, for example, by Volokh, who we've mentioned, 
is that that goes too far because everything anyone does is in some sense expressive of a message. So what about the chef who puts the food on the plate? What about the artist? What about, uh, not the artist, the artisan, the craftsman, and so on? I think the argument, in, uh, the baker's argument is, well, this is about a wedding celebration. It's about making a cake. Interesting discussion in some of the briefs, including the, the, the baker's brief, about the symbolism of the cake uh, itself at the wedding reception in which the couple cuts the cake and, and symbolically put the cake in each other's mouths as, as the, one of the first acts of a unified couple. So all of that, uh, you know, that's all consistent with what the arguments uh, that's being made by the petitioner. The question is, does that go too far uh, in terms of protecting things that are not properly regarded as expressive of a particular message? That's the basic debate. And, and as I said at the end of my remarks, I mean, yeah, I, I don't I, – I, I, I totally get that that is the baker's belief. That's his conscience, and he's entitled to that. What I'm saying is if, if we filter this through First Amendment law, um, I think a proper application of speech law would say that his – again, this – what I would – I don't mean this – dismissively, but the sort of metaphysical conception that he is speaking about the couple, he's giving his approval of the marriage by baking the cake, um, is just not relevant. Again, First Amendment looks to what's called I would ask Professor Conkle to correct me if I'm wrong about this. He's really the true First Amendment, the reasonable observer. And and as Volek said, you know, when, when you go to a wedding and you see the cake, the reasonable observer does not think, you know, the baker blessed this union. Um, he's not there. I mean, he might show up to deliver it three hours before the ceremony, but he's not there. Um, you know, nobody probably even knows he made it. So the idea that it burdens his conscience, which I don't deny, is different than under First Amendment law, which considers the perspective of an objective observer. Would they regard that, the, the, the cake at a wedding, as an endorsement? You know, the, whoever, whatever company provided the food here, do we think that they necessarily endorse the views of the American Constitution Society on political and legal issues? No. Who would think that? So I would say, why would you? You think this anything different about a, about a cake? Now, just a one footnote on that: the baker makes the argument that uh, Professor Sanders rejects. The baker also makes independently an argument that if, in fact, as he argues, this is art. If I'm like the Picasso of, of cake makers, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter what a reasonable observer would think. Uh, the argument is is that if in fact it is art, if it's art, uh, the government simply cannot compel an artist to produce art against that artist's conscience. So you can't make the you can't make uh, Picasso if he were still alive paint another painting. Uh, you just can't do it. Period. So he's making kind of an absolutist argument, uh, which presupposes that the, the creation of a cake should count as art, which is obviously debatable. I have more question about the cake. So, uh, so do the briefs offer us more information about, for instance, the menu or the, the, the cakes that uh, Phillips made before? And if, if uh, by assumption that all, Phillips, uh, all the cake that Phillips made before are, contains uh, heterosexual uh, marriage information, and would that Make a difference uh, to 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 the to the to the result of the case. I think there's a lot of talk in the briefs, including pictures, uh, about how artistic these are. You know that he's been doing this, and he, you know, basically he does create works of art in his view. But I don't think there's don't think anything think, about any specific. I don't think messages. most of the cakes have yeah. messages other than they might have the topper with the bride and the groom. You know, but at, at least there were no pictures of. You know, or you know, and do do wedding cakes even typically say "God bless this wedding"? No, I, mean, I, I think that was that was a hypothetical. Yeah, I mean, push the birthday envelope. cakes yeah. are the ones that have inscriptions. Yeah. Wedding cakes typically don't. Yeah. So no, I don't. And again, the you know, he he basically told them he couldn't serve them before he even knew. They might have just said, you know, that picture right there, that's what we want. You know, so nothing special, nothing heterosexual or homosexual about that image. We just want that cake. The, the, the God bless this marriage, that, that was basically, I think either that's in the U.S. brief or maybe the petition, I'm not sure who, it's on the baker's side, and it's basically trying to make the case that surely you could not require a baker 
to put on not just God bless, but God blesses this marriage. You couldn't require the baker to do that for homosexual marriage, uh, same-sex marriage, if he would do it for heterosexual marriage. Uh, that would be impermissible. The, the Civil Rights Commission says, it takes the, takes the argument and says, yeah, you can. If, if the baker puts a particular message on uh, a cake for a heterosexual marriage, likewise uh, for anybody else. But again, that's not this case. Right, it's not this case. Is there an argument to be made about a baker or a service provider's ability to change their mind at some point in their practice or their ownership of the business? Or is the argument of they've done this before for one client, so now they must do it for another client? How long does that hold for? Is that something that you can go back and say, 20 years ago you baked a cake that said X, Y, Z, so now you have to do it for me? That's a great question. I don't know the answer. I think, I mean, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what this baker did after being ordered to treat same-sex couples equally is he doesn't do any wedding cakes uh, at this point until the litigation is pending. But interesting question, you know, uh, as you say, how long, if you put God blesses this uh, marriage on a cake, uh, can you stop doing that categorically across the board to avoid uh, having to do something you think your conscience forbids? I don't know the answer. Yeah. I mean, are you, is it premised on the idea that he's had a born-again experience in the, in the intervening time? Or, Not you know, necessarily no. at all, just the yeah. notion of I would think that someone would have the right to change their mind Yeah. So the argument yeah. of they've yeah. done this before, so now they must do it again. Yeah. Well, I think you'd have to, what you'd have to show is he's been requested to do it and he, he's refused to do it. Maybe the request just never came up in 20 years. Sure. So, again, you know, d- depend. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, the Civil Rights Commission basically takes the position if, if he has ever sold something to a straight couple, then he has to sell it to everybody. On the, on the other hand, I don't think anyone's contending that he's in violation of, of the anti-discrimination rule by what he's doing now, which is not to make any oh, cakes. Sure. Right, yeah. so he has, in fact, in a sense, done what you're you're suggesting. He stopped making cakes, uh, even wedding though he used cakes. to make them wedding cakes. Even though he used to make them for uh, uh, opposite sex couples, presumably he's no longer discriminating, even though he was. Although I think he may still be under. An, well, no, I, he's under an order he's to, under to order. do equal treatment, right, but right. he's not in order to sell wedding right, cakes. Right, no, that's right. But, yeah. but if he did sell wedding cakes, he'd have to give right equal exactly yeah exactly. Uh, just as a kind of a hypothetical sort of thing, if the court wanted to move along the religious freedom side of of the spectrum and go towards that sort of an argument, like you were saying, they have to overcome Smith. Uh, could maybe what would be one of the maybe the arguments you think the court would use if it was to fight for the baker? I, I would think maybe something they could cabin Smith and say, you know, you, you can't you can make you can't go against laws that. You know, peyote, they're actively smoking it, right? Whereas in this case, they're forcing the baker to do something. So, like, maybe I'm just thinking maybe they could cabins would say, well, you know, a law that doesn't, that, you know, requires you to, to not do something is different than a law that requires you to do something, you know, you know. Omission versus commission. I'm not, I'm not sure if that matters. The difference, though, they you know they were smoking peyote. The law said you may not smoke peyote. He's discriminating. The law says you may not discriminate. I, I don't. I, I mean, I, I just don't see a difference there. Um, Dan may have more thoughts about possible ways of. You could sort of, that would up. sort of play into the hybrid claim that you are coercing speech, uh, at least arguably, and you're infringing religion. But but I, I think the act omission or act abstention thing it would be pretty hard to maintain. You could try it, but I, I don't know that that would, that would work. Okay, I apologize for asking a second question, but this just occurred to me. So I actually think the florist, um, no, I'm sorry, the photographer is a harder case. But I have, bottom line, no problem really with compelling them both. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but I just thought of this. How about... You know, people who are not um, ministers or religious figures, but are there cases involving people who perform weddings who are justices of the peace type people who are not government officials, not a clerk of the court type, but, you know, there are people online. You can find people to marry you who have authority to do that. Um, And so they're actually taking part in the wedding but refusing to do it 
for same-sex couples. And I'm more familiar with, like, my, my sister married a woman when it was not legal in New York, and she went to Connecticut and found someone online who did same-sex weddings in Connecticut, not a religious religiously affiliated person, but are there cases, you know, that seems like an even harder case. The well, first issue would be, is there a public, is there an anti-discrimination yeah, law? Yes, so say there's an anti-discrimination law, yeah. and someone who holds himself out as, you know, I will perform weddings, but will not perform same-sex weddings, where they're actually doing what people are claiming here, yeah, you know, actually actual, taking that, part actual and actually marrying the people. Yeah. I'm wondering what, you know, what you both think about that. Talk a little bit about, in my family law class, these quickie internet ordination things. But, but every one of those that I'm familiar with is actually premised on the idea you are, you are being ordained into a religious, you were being made a minister. I mean, now again, you know, the, one, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster right. is one of them, but I think that's because most of these laws are written, uh, most of the state marriage solemnization laws are written so that um, basically the only person who's not a government official, okay. um, who can, who can uh, do, who's not a judge or a uh, 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 or, or something like that, uh, who can do a wedding is a, a minister. Mm. Now, there was a Seventh Circuit case. There's that a challenge, that right? To narrow to that. that you have to allow a secular humanist right, to do it. Humanist. But, you know, for the most part, again, all of those online things that I'm familiar with are premised on the idea this gets you into the idea that you are a minister. And so, if that's the case, then I would think the First Amendment's protection for religion would say mm. you can't force that person to do a wedding that they don't want to do because it would violate violate their religious conscience because what if they are, they're after not, all, though? a minister. I'm curious, like, a hypothetical state statute that allows, well, like, my husband got a pass, you know, in Indiana was allowed to perform a marriage and not based on any religious affiliation. Presumably you'd have... The Lawyers can do that. I think it was because he's a lawyer. In Indiana, right, you can... Right, be made, a lawyer can, can do that. You can be made a, what's called a judge pro tem. right. So following that logic, I haven't looked into this, but I would say if, if the idea is that you are being made a judge for a day, a judge is a state actor and a judge could not engage in that kind of discrimination, I would say. Because the lawyer is not acting as a private person. The lawyer is acting by, with, with authority vested that normally only judges would have. And, of course, judges are state actors. The, the other You're fighting the hypothetical here. Uh -huh. I mean, a state could do it. A state could allow non-religious figures to perform marriages. I don't mean to interrupt, but the thing that comes to my mind is I believe boat captains can actually mm. There you go, boat captains. Marriages, mm -hmm. which would not necessarily be religiously affiliated and would not be a state actor. Yeah. So I don't know yeah. if that's... Well, as Dan said, I think the easy way out of this is there's no public accommodations law that would probably be understood to cover that. Many public accommodations laws even, you know, don't... I mean, they say you have to be a business of five people or more or something like that. So I, I, I think you'd have a hard time finding a law that would even co would even purport to be able to coerce that person. But, but presumably if there were, uh, and then other analogous cases that could arise would be things like organist uh, mm -hmm. to play the music for the wedding, uh, a singer who uh, is asked to sing at the wedding. So there you do have, presumably, you don't have the more uh, somewhat attenuated claim of the baker. You're there you are, everyone would agree, participating in the celebration of the wedding to the extent that that matters. I mean, I think And, and that I'm that more would, sympathetic to yeah. those claims. I'm, I'm more sympathetic to the photographer's claim, for example, not necessarily yeah. because I think because of the it's more expressive. It is, but I, I think the distinction is the photographer is required to be more intimately involved with the ceremony, and that is a more direct burden on conscience. Um, the, the, the argument that Phillips is making that because he makes the cake, he's like somehow there, to me, is just too attenuated. The photographer is indisputably interacting with the ceremony itself. Thank you.